So we've had big announcements this week from Intel. Intel is set to acquire a tower semiconductor. They're a foundry. Never heard of them? You know, lots of people haven't heard of them. What they do is they specialize in special, what they call specialty technologies, analog, RF, high voltage, that sort of stuff. But Intel has decided to acquire them for $5.4 billion. Joining me on this show is Dylan Patel from Semi Analysis, who's going to give us some of his insights into why this matters in the grand scheme things of Intel Foundry Services. What's your minimum specification? Well, shucks, the cloud is here, but which cloud do you trust? Manage your infrastructure with Linode, the biggest independent cloud services provider. Linode offers double the database performance per dollar than the big four, and now enhances it further with new NVMe-backed block storage. Spin up a game server, website, personal VPN, or something more bespoke today with a free $100 60-day credit at linode.com slash techdeppotato. Hi, Dylan. Welcome to the channel. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, great to be on uh, Tech Tech Potato, I think you call it. So... You yeah. think I caught it? No, it is what I caught it. <laughs> I hope you like the logo I put up. It's, uh, um, it's great. So give everybody who doesn't know who you are, what you do and what semi-analysis is. Let's just start with that. Sure. So uh, semi-analysis is a uh, boutique research firm uh, targeting the semiconductor industry, mostly supply chain, uh, manufacturing equipment, chemicals, et cetera, things of that nature. Um, and yeah, we analyze the industry. Um, so that's, it's, that's, that's what, uh, that's what semi analysis, semi analysis is very, uh, the name is very simple, hopefully. Um, if, if, if you've never heard of semi analysis before, go check out the website, simple Google search. Uh, Dylan has breakdowns on a lot of companies in this space, as he said, supply chain, but also the financials behind it, where they are making money, where they're not making money, what it means for them to be in this sort of supply constraints scenario. I mean, dude, I learn a lot from your stuff. So I hope you've got some insight into um, Intel and Tower Semi here. It's, uh, I, I'll be honest, I didn't hear about Tower Semi until um, people were talking about it on Twitter a couple of days ago, but you've had a deeper look into who they are yeah so i mean they've, they've generally been considered one of the uh you know you could almost call them a lower quality asset simply because all of their fabs are much smaller and, and and the way semiconductor manufacturing works you have to have scale in order to be profitable um so they've always sort of languished they've been the home for many uh fabs that other firms didn't want that they couldn't support because they were too small um and so they've they've acquired fabs all over the world. I think they've really only built two fabs themselves. And then, you know, they've acquired fabs in Japan and in, in the U.S. And, um, and and they've built up a business of technologies that are very niche um, and maybe not, you know, quite as large and interesting as, you know, hey, say, hey, you know, Intel or TSMC that we, we generally talk about all the time. They're based in Israel. They got about five thousand employees. The revenue is about one one point one one point two billion dollars last year, and then Intel comes in and a five point four billion dollar acquisition. It's going to take about twelve months to complete. Um, and a lot of questions. We just had the call with uh, Pat Gelsinger and the CEO of Tower, and a lot of the questions from the financial analysts there were. Why? <laughs> and, and how does this make sense for Intel, this acquisition? Yeah, that, that, uh, that question is, I mean, that's the critical question. And, and, it's, and, and it's why that Intel was courting Global Foundries before they, uh, they pulled the trigger on Tower. You know, maybe Global Foundries couldn't get through regulatory approval or maybe they couldn't agree on a price. But um, here, it, it sort of does make sense in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we've talked about this in the past, uh, Ian, you and I. Um, it's that that Intel has a big lack in the ability to extend, you know, to interface with the external world with their fabs, um, given the, you know, the history of them doing very pro customized uh, process nodes that were hand tuned for their specific designs. That just doesn't work in the foundry in industry, um, whereas Tower, you know, comes at it from the other angle. They're extremely specialized, extremely, uh, you know, lower volumes. Right. I mean, you mentioned the revenue figure before. Uh, they shipped 2 million wafers last year, um, and Intel shipped 2 million wafers last year, but Intel's revenue was, you know, call it 65 times more. 
Um, you know, Intel's doing advanced nodes and they're doing 300 millimeter wafers and Tower's doing 150 and 200 millimeter wafers. So that's part of it. But um, it's just a completely different arena from what Intel generally plays in. And that drives a lot of synergies across each of their businesses, right? Intel can offer foundry services um, in these areas they didn't have capabilities before. They can, um, they have teams that have worked on very specialized technologies that are very difficult to uh, work with. And then they've made those specialty technologies a foundry offering. Whereas Intel has, you know, sort of the same issue, right? They have specialty technologies that they need to offer as a foundry um, and they currently can't. Um, so, so it's sort of a synergy in that way. And then Tower gets the advantage of, hey, Intel, you've, you've got, you know, you're willing to throw down $25, $30 billion of CapEx, you know, which is more than our entire company has spent in the last 30 years on CapEx. Um, so, you know, we can, we can stop using maybe 150 millimeter wafers or 200 millimeter wafers and transition to 300 where it makes sense. And we can, you know, we can, we can put the money down for, you know, a lot of wafer fab equipment or chemicals that we prior didn't have the leverage or, you know, bargaining ability to even secure. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of positives on both angles. It's interesting you bring up the global foundries angle because that's why I think most of the audience are going to see some parallels to what Tower does with what global foundries does. Global foundries isn't leading edge. Intel is leading edge. And the idea is that, say, Intel addresses 70% of the market and something like global foundries um, goes after the other 30%. But Tower also goes after that 30%. So Intel always focusing on that sort of high performance leading edge technology. If they're going to start foundry services, they're going to have customers who not only want compute, they also want low power, they also want uh, RF, they also want MEMS, they want analog, they want power, they want uh, display technology. Display technology is in big demand right now. And having, uh, I think it was poignant on the call, somebody said, with the tower acquisition, you get a company that has spent two to three decades building up a foundry business where Intel doesn't necessarily have the expertise. Um, so the value is not only in um, the ability to make these sort of non-high performance type products, but also in the personnel. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over the next 12 months. Um, <laughs> you and I, we've got Intel Investor Day marked on our um, calendar for the 17th, which is what, a couple of days away. Um, I expect they're going to go into a bit more detail there about what this acquisition means and a bit more global scope um, for foundry services. Where exactly do you think Foundry Services is going to sit for Intel? Usually Foundry is a lower margin business than Intel typically plays in. Um, yeah, that's that's the funny thing is, uh, yeah, Intel historically has had, you know, run 60% margins, right? That's what their target has always been. But, you know, more recently, you know, I think on the Q3 call or, yeah, on the Q3 call last year, um, Pat said, yeah, our long, you know, next year, we're probably going to be 51 to 53% and we'll slowly get back to the 60. And, uh, you know, TSMC on their most recent call said, yeah, we're 53% uh, long-term uh, or higher. So it's like, sure, Foundry used to be a lower margin business, but the best of the best in the Foundry business is going to be running at a higher margin than Intel, who is fabbing their own wafers and designing them, right? So if you, if you think about like, what the cost advantage, you know, TSMC and AMD have or and design, you know, the cost plus design advantage and technology advantage they have is, is immense when you sort of stack both of their margins on top of each other, right? Like AMD, you know, following the Xilinx acquisition, um, you know, and, and with all the margin expansion they've had, you know, with increasing prices and more high performance technologies, data center, et cetera, um, they've, they've pushed, you know, they're saying this year would have been about 51% without Xilinx and Xilinx runs at like 65, 70 uh, percent margins. So now you now you stack that on and add that business, and you know AMD is at like fifty five percent, fifty three percent. I don't know this year, and then and then uh, TSMC is likewise at like fifty three percent. And it's like so both of them have both of those margins. You know to to sell a data center CPU. You know and and somehow AMD still comes out on top in total cost of ownership, right? So it's it's that just shows how far Intel has fallen and how far they have to you know catch up on a design and manufacturing perspective. So I, I guess with the, with this acquisition of Tower, um, what else does Intel Foundry Services need to be successful? Um, so so one of the one of the key parts of this uh, acquisition is that they have existing relationships with design teams now, um, and the inertia 
of the semiconductor industry should not be underestimated. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, you can think of it as like, hey, Intel has all this inertia right now uh, just because they've been the dominant player. And so enterprises, a lot of enterprises won't even consider buying AMD. You know, even if AMD could manufacture all the chips or TSMC could for them, all the chips they needed, you know, there's the inertia of just being locked in, being with who you're familiar with, right? You know, in the, in the, two, in the 2000s and 90s, was, you never got fired for buying IBM. Um, it's, it's almost like a similar, similar motive there. Um, but within the foundry business, right, to, to be a design team, to be the head of, you know, some, someone um, of, of some fabulous design firm uh, and to say, hey, we're going to spend significant resources, uh, you know, even seeing if Intel's viable is, is quite the uh, investment. And, and this sort of helps them along that way, um, you know, being able to secure, you know, being able to say, hey, well, they actually do manufacture this for us now. Um, and, you know, and for the last two years, you know, since they've owned them, we've been using them. So maybe we look at their advanced offerings, too. Um, it'll be a slow grind, but this should help them, you know, with a lot of these relationships. Um, so, so to finish, when you say slow grind, in my mind, I'm thinking sort of in the five to 10 year time frame, we're going to eventually IFS is going to start building, you know, proper revenue rather than just, you know, pennies here and there. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I mean, like technically, IFS already you know had revenue with the uh, with yeah. packaging. Um, one of the reports on my website is about a uh, Graviton three being packaged by Intel using uh, EMIB, um, and you know, so that that sure they have some wins here and there, but like you said, that's it's going to be pennies. It's not going to be you know huge volume or anything until at least twenty four, twenty five, and that even then, that's going to be like maybe one or two designs here and there if they execute on their process roadmap. And then, you know, given that the likelihood for more delays is, you know, not remote in any way, right? It's very possible. Um, you know, no one, no one trusts Intel. Um, the, the, you know, the, that foundry offering is definitely a five to 10 years, you know, significant for significant revenue. Um, but, you know, with, with the acquisition of Tower, you know, um, for example, on the call, one, one comment that I really, uh, enjoyed was they mentioned we don't even have the scale to capture uh, revenue in PMIC and power management ICs. And yeah. um, if you think about, you know, what's going on, uh, I mean, everything around you has, has a PMIC. Um, and now, you know, with DDR5, even DDR5 modules have their own PMICs on, uh, on the module. And so demand is just skyrocketing, but Tower, you know, Tower, despite having the technology to be able to be in that field, they didn't have the scale to invest in that, so that's a uh, that's something that maybe you know Intel can hit the ground running um, and help them you know be able to get that scale and scale that business up sooner than that five to ten year mark, right? So I, I guess to finish off before we make this video exceptionally long, what are you wanting to get out of Investor Day on the seventeenth from Intel? Um, I want them to just come right out and say it. I mean, everything, everyone knows it. Um, and they've hinted at it before, uh, that, you know, they're not going to be very profitable for the next three years. Um, they've said, you know, everybody, everybody in the technology side is like, of course they're not competitive, right? It's this year is all Milan versus Ice Lake. And, you know, the year after it's going to be Genoa versus uh, Sapphire Rapids in terms of actual volume, it's just not competitive at all. Um, so just come out there and say, you know, we're not going to be competitive in, uh, in, in server, for a while to come and that's going to kill our earnings, but that's fine because we're just going to spend every dollar we make anyways, reinvesting into the business. Um, you know, Pat's, Pat's been saying that, you know, last year they hired over 10,000 engineers, um, you know, which is like almost the size of an AMD. Right. But you know, that this is, this is, you know, they, they just, there's, there's the phenomenon of like shareholder turnover and a lot of the shareholders of Intel are currently like, you know, I would say people who are looking after the dividend and it just being a value company, right? Like earnings to price is very low. Um, and and the, earner, the the investor base needs to be completely churned uh, because of what Pat Gelsinger is going to do to this company. So that's what I'm looking forward to investor day being about like, hey, our R&D plus CapEx is going to be over $40 billion. Um, I mean, the writing's on the wall, but they just need to say it. And, and our, we're not going to generate any cash um, and we're not going to increase our dividend anymore and we're not going to do any buybacks, which they've said some of these things, but, you know, be very, very definitive about it. Um, and, and you know, mark this as the turnover. I mean, the, the turnaround of the century, right? Or, you know, the biggest tech turnaround ever. 
um, you know, which is what I hope for. And I hope, you know, everyone who wants competition in the market, you know, hopes for. Competition, supply, pricing, it's yep. all a bit of a cluster right now. So we'll see if Intel really puts puts the hammer down on its investor meeting, actually gives insight. I think that's what's going to be really important. Thank you for spending your time with me and talking to us about the tower acquisition and uh, good luck on semi-analysis. All right, thanks. If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support. Thank you.